We thought you might like to know that there is an organization in Indianapolis that focuses on teen homelessness. Their name is Outreach Indiana, and you can learn more about them at outreachindiana.org. And today, I have the privilege of speaking to their chief executive officer, Andrew Neal. We talk about how pervasive in Marion County homelessness is. How can they reach more, and how can you help reach more homeless teens? And how does Indianapolis deal with homelessness in a way that other cities might not? Is that good or bad? We find out more here on The Chris Spangle Show. Andrew Neal, thanks so much for joining me here on the program. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad to be here, Chris. So tell me a little bit about Outreach. When did you get started and what do you do for the city of Indianapolis? Yeah, absolutely. So Outreach has been around for 25 years. We're celebrating our 25th uh, year anniversary. And uh, yeah, we, we focus on working with youth and young adults who are experiencing homelessness. For us, uh, those ages are really 14 to 24. Um, so, you know, just trying to, to get involved in their lives, help them uh, navigate towards stability and life transformation. So the last time I spoke to Outreach, I was shocked to find out about the number of teen homeless here in Marion County, which Marion County is about a million people. Donut County is around two and a half million, 12th largest city, just to give context to our listeners. Uh, about how many people would you estimate fit into those age brackets? I think you said 18 to 25. Uh, so we focus on 14 to 24, but you're okay. asking, I mean, you're, you're along the, the right lines there. Um, and, and you're, you're opening a can of worms, Chris, um, which, which is good. Cause I, I love to talk about this. Um, listen, the, the reality is, uh, you know, we, we are drastically undercounting the number of youth who are experiencing homelessness in Marion County. Um, there, there's a number of different ways that we get at these counts. Um, one of the most common ways that people know about is this point in time survey uh, that happens uh, once a year in the winter time. And a bunch of different agencies participate in that. And we show up at, at shelters um, and try to, try to do a count on that given day, how many people are experiencing literal homelessness. Um, you know, from from that information, we've been able to glean like, you know, in 2021, um, there was between 80 and 90 uh, you, uh, young adults between the ages of 18 and 24 who were experiencing homelessness. But what we found out was um, that that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of the number of youth and young adults who are experiencing the HUD definition of, of homelessness. So HUD um expands the definition of homelessness from literal you know I'm, I'm either living on the streets or living in a shelter uh, uh homelessness to also incorporating a couple of different su subcategories like uh doubled up um is is you know another form of homelessness that a lot of us are familiar with um, some of us have even had family members who've experienced that uh can, there's can also you those explain who are, that for those who don't yeah yeah absolutely so doubled up so um we have a large number of youth who are, are doubled up. So they are living uh, with a family member or a friend. Uh, a common narrative we hear at Outreach is, you know, um, I got in a fight with my with my family and um, I, you know, was kicked out of the house and um, had nowhere else to go. And so my friend's uh, family let me move in with them. Well, they're, they're, they're homeless. They are not living in a home. Um, yeah, they're staying in a, a temporary place it might be an apartment, uh, but according to HUD, um, according to, I think, a lot of us um, who work in this field, I mean, that that is a form of homelessness. Um, you know, likewise, those uh, fleeing from domestic violence, uh, if they haven't entered into a shelter system, but maybe they found a, a safe haven somewhere, um, that's, that's another form of homelessness. Uh, you, you've also got, um, you know, those who are imminently uh, homeless about ready to to enter into a shelter um, you know that they are individuals who need to be represented in this count as well and so when we when we start to analyze data um, we realize that we're, we're undercounting significantly um, we don't in that point in time survey look at uh, teenagers those in high school um, now we know that there are McKinney Vento McKinney Vento was the act uh, that was passed to provide protections and resources 
uh, for children uh, and youth who experience homelessness. We know from schools that there's a large number of McKinney Bento students, over 2,000 K through uh, 12, grader, 12th graders who are uh, experiencing homelessness during an academic year. Um, and so the reality is, I mean, we are hitting, um, we're, we're drastically undercounting. Uh, the number of youth that are experiencing homelessness in Indianapolis. And um, yeah, I think a lot of people are probably, you know, wondering why. <laughs> yeah. And that's my next question is why, how does someone end up I experiencing homelessness, especially someone that young, you touched on maybe mm -hmm. family issues. Um, and I, I think out, out, you know, in the world, people who maybe can you kind of like give us a picture of who is the population that you're serving? You know, we may when we think homelessness, I think people kind of build an avatar in their mind of a homeless person. But I have done this show enough to know that that isn't necessarily the case, that this is a very broad range of folks who experience homelessness. Does that apply also to, you know, that 14 to 24 year old age range? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you're you're, you're spot on uh, the, the stories. While the individual stories are, are drastically different, there are some prevailing themes that we see woven throughout. Um, you know, uh, a, a number of young people, again, uh, in high school uh, are asked to leave their homes or their families are asked uh, to leave their homes through eviction or for closure. Um, and that puts them in, in a difficult situation. Um, we know that there are a number of LGBTQ uh, youth and young adults who experience homelessness at higher uh, rates and their peers. Um, we also uh, know that uh, another hot point for youth homelessness is those entering out of a system uh, into um, the world and, and, and into society without some of those supports. So for example, uh, those who age out of foster care um, sometimes can, can become homeless. Um, those who are re-entering from the criminal justice system. Uh, just the other day, um, we, we had a, a young man who, who was in here and um, I, I had a conversation with him and um, 18 year old, you know, just sharp young man and said, hey, you know, what, what brought you here? And he told me how um, he was just released uh, from prison the other day. He had done um, a, a year, uh, was tried as an adult on an intimidation charge. Um, he wanted to go back um, with his family, but they didn't feel comfortable um, having him back home after he was released. And um, the best option that they had for him was to drop him off at, at Wheeler. And um, he told me, he's like, man, I, I am scared to death because in the last night alone, I've seen guys overdose. I've seen guys threaten to kill other guys. And uh, when, when you're talking about an 18 year old and, and the best option we have for them is uh, an emergency shelter for adults, um, Man, that's that's a, a problem in our city. Yeah, let's let's talk about what Indianapolis does, because I know that we have CHIP, which is like a city run centrally. It's like an information hub spot. You tell me if I'm getting any of this wrong. And then mm -hmm. there's Wheeler Mission, which is kind of like the big it's the top of mind thing for folks that is a private organization that does. Um, it's an emergency shelter, like you, like you said. They've just, in the last couple of years, built a women's shelter, but it was just for men at that point. I know there's, you know, in a city the size of Indianapolis, how many different organizations are working on people experiencing homelessness, and what are some of the challenges that stick out in a city that doesn't necessarily have? I mean, is I know you've lived other places, so I'm interested to kind of hear how it was done in other places, how it's done here, and what you think of that. Oh, that's a good question. Um, yeah, there, there's uh, a large number of agencies uh, throughout our city that are working with uh, the homeless population. Um, you know, CHIP, CHIP kind of convenes all of them and, and is able to bring them uh, together. You know, in the youth serving world, you've got some great organizations like Stopover and Damien Center. You've got, um, you know, Trinity Haven. Um, they're, they're doing some great things. Indiana Youth Group. Um, there's this really good you know, cohesiveness among the youth serving organizations, which I think is is amazing. On the adult side, yeah, you've got uh, Wheeler is, is a big provider. Um, Horizon House is another one that's doing some some great work in the city. Uh, but I but I think what we've seen are the challenges of having so many different agencies 
all with different missions and, and different uh, client focuses. Um, and, and you're trying to bring them all together and you're trying to figure out, okay, how do we communicate? Because oftentimes we're serving uh, the same client. Um, how do we prioritize the needs of those clients? Uh, it really takes a Herculean effort to bring, uh, bring some, some sensibility and some cohesiveness to uh, kind of a, a chaotic environment. Um, to answer your question about how other cities are doing this, so I, I moved from Denver uh, to Indianapolis about eight years ago now. Um, I worked for the Denver Rescue Mission out there. I was, I was part of a, a really innovative program uh, between the city of Denver, uh, the Denver Rescue Mission, and then the faith community at large, uh, which worked to help uh, homeless families and seniors move into uh, permanent housing and stay in permanent housing. And we did it through connecting them with mentor teams from these local faith communities and businesses and service organizations to provide that social support that those families needed. Um, I, I, I think Indianapolis uh, is, is is starting to, to realize, hopefully, that some of those more innovative approaches are going to open uh, the doors to, to better results for our homeless population. So we've got to figure out, I mentioned all these service providers. Um, there, a lot of them are, are agencies. Um, what I didn't mention outside of Wheeler is there's a number of faith-based organizations that are also uh, entering into this, this uh, arena and providing services. And sometimes there's a disconnect between the social services and the faith-based organizations. Uh, the disconnect can be over uh, values. The disconnect can be uh, just making sure we don't we have the right people at the table and we don't leave anyone out. Um, we have to figure out a, a better way to build that bridge. Uh, I, I can tell you that because I'm, I run an organization that is very involved in the social service agency uh, realm, but we're also a faith based organization as well. And uh, we've been able to navigate that without sacrificing our values. Um, but still being a player in some innovative programming that puts us in really good relationship uh, with others. So I, I think Indianapolis has to has to figure out that piece. Um, and I think, you know, from from a larger scale perspective, man, what what is Indiana good at? Um, at the end of the day, uh, Hoosiers are, are known for their hospitality. I mean, I think that's something that we pride ourselves on. Um, and what we know about hospitality and how that works with homelessness is uh, those who experience homelessness, one of the greatest indicators of the success to not reenter homelessness is the social support and the social connection that they have. So what would it look like um, if, you know, we had something like in Denver where uh, there, there was social support for youth and young adults, uh, if they moved into, you know, a Carmel location or they moved into Lawrence or, you know, they moved uh, into the 46201 zip code, that they were connected with other individuals who said, yeah, I'm going to walk alongside you during this first year as you kind of get your feet. I'm going to show you the ropes in this community. Um, and, you know, when you have a bad day, uh, when you want to flip off your boss and, and walk off the job, um, you've got someone who's, who's in your corner and who's going to talk you through that. I think that would make a tremendous difference because the reality is as much as we want to provide really good programs and services uh, to the to the, the homeless individuals that, that we get to work with, programs and services can only move the needle so much, but relationship is often the determining factor uh, for success. Yeah, I mean, I'm a libertarian in full disclosure, mm -hmm. but I'm a communitarian because I've just come, I mean, it comes from my Christian faith. Like there is, no, we are all interconnected in significant ways and doing the public affairs show combined with the pandemic just impressed upon me the absolute necessity of community and the way that that builds bridges in ways the politics can break down. You know, our, our last uh, conversation was, about domestic violence and the contributing factors to domestic violence. And it was, we need more empathetic conversations and more community and more people to reach out. It's, you see it kind of in the gun violence conversation, who was intervening in this situation, you know, with the ending of Roe v. Wade, who's going to take care of, you know, the women and the kids and what happens after that. Um, how, 
And and that's sort of the, the point of this show is encouraging people to step up, serve your circle, be a part of solving some of these issues by taking care of the hundred people around you and getting engaged with organizations like you. Where where would somebody start if they wanted to take on that task of partnering with one of your kids and helping them transition out? Like, what would that look like? And are there organizations that do that sort of stuff? Or is that something that outreach does? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think where we are going um, and what my heartbeat is, is uh, it's, it's not just about providing services to these youth and young adults. It's about connecting them to great relationships. Um, and, and I think there's other organizations in the city that, that are about that as well, maybe not specifically for this population, um, but that's what I look for. When, when, when I think about uh, the dollars that, that I invest into charitable organizations in the city, I wanna know that they have a relationship first approach. Um, I, I look at how they connect volunteers to impactful opportunities. Um, that, that's something that's, that's very much uh, on my radar when I think about you know, organizations that I wanna support and get in partnership with. Uh, outreach, uh, th that's the reality of, of, of the calling, um, you could say, that, that we have in this organization. Um, yes, we're, we're helping youth and young adults find stability and life transformation, but we're also um, introducing these youth and young adults to other individuals who can open doors, who can um, provide reconciling relationships in a way that uh, a program or a service never could. And, and in return, I can almost guarantee every volunteer who walks in their door, when you sit across the table from a youth or young adult who has experienced homelessness and you get into relationship with them, I, I always hear, I don't know how I'm going to relate to them. But the reality is, Chris, I mean, we, we have all experienced brokenness. We have all experienced pain and suffering. We all have a story to tell and all those stories matter. And story is the most powerful connecting element. And if you can if you can be vulnerable enough to hear another individual's story and to reciprocate with your own, you can connect with any single one, any single person, no matter how different they are. So we talk about the turmoil uh, that, that the last couple of years have been since the pandemic, since, you know, um, since the, the, the unrest and the, and the protests uh, throughout the nation. We talk about uh, the divisiveness of Roe v. Wade and all these different political elements. But what I'm interested in are the individual stories, um, because I can sit down across a table from another person who I think, man, I, politically, we don't align. Socially, we don't align. Uh, you know, socioeconomically, we don't align. But when I hear your story and I recognize you for the person, I mean, not to get preachy, Chris, but for, for, for the image bearer that you are, um, then guess what? That, that breaks down those walls. And I want outreach to be a place where, man, you could come in and you could get to know a youth and you learn just as much from them as they learn from you. That'd be a pretty cool experience. Yeah, we uh, interviewed Starfish Initiative, which pairs mentors, you know, families, economically disadvantaged kids with cross-cultural folks to share different experiences to help them get them into secondary, post-secondary education. You know, you just see the the stories that come out of big brothers and big sisters and, you know, all that mentoring stuff is is just so important for kids um, and adults. I mean, I still I, I still need mentoring all the time as I near 40. Um, you know, one, one question I, I know, are you a pastor still? I, I know in your bio, it says you are, are you a pastor of a church? Yeah. Uh, I'm not, I'm not pastoring now at a church. Um, but I, uh, am still an ordained pastor. So yeah, I, I get out there and you know what, uh, once a pastor, always a pastor. And so there's still that ministry element every day at my, my day job. So there's so much conversation. This is sort of something that grates on me a little bit. And I don't know, you know, I, you probably spend far less time on Facebook and Twitter than I do um, because of our different jobs. I think there's a sense that the church, the church has certainly earned some of its bad reputation as a whole. But in your daily experiences, kind of working within these spaces, is there a defense of Christians in their service of vulnerable populations and what is that case uh man okay so that that is a big topic 
the reality is, um, you know, I, I'm not going to completely defend the church in that because listen, the reality is there's a lot more that can be done. And we can talk about that in a second, but some of the things that have been done are often glossed over. And I think that's unfortunate, right? Um, Christians in the United States, I think um, some of the statistics that I've read, and I, I don't, I, we'd have to source them out, but they uh, they have led the way in the number of adoptions um, and, uh, and their involvement in foster care. I mean, I think you think back to some of the pillar organizations that have been in the social services sector. Um, you think back to a YMCA, you know, was started as a faith-based organization, has this longstanding history, still has its faith-based roots. Um, I think locally, I mean, the, the Christmore House uh, in Hawville was, was, you know, an organization that was started, um, you know, out of uh, two women living out their faith. So, you know, it would be unfair to say that churches have not done um, enough uh, or, or haven't done a lot in the space. They've done a lot in this space. Um, sometimes we like to gloss over that. You know, I, I keep going back to, though, um, there are some really good organizations uh, that have been spun out of churches um, over the last even decade. Uh, so if you look into the Chicago area, uh, man, Lawndale, you, you want to talk about an, a, a, a church-based ministry that has has really uh, enveloped its community and has grown into this incredible thing. Um, man, they, they are doing some amazing development work in that city. Uh, the Christian um, uh the, the other Christian groups in the city that, that are doing that, you know, there's some churches like Brookside, our, our home church, um, that, that we had been a part of, you know, they're doing some incredible things. Um, we, we get to see a lot of that that's happening. But, but the reality is, I think why people say that, though, is because, uh, because of the megaphone that um, those in our faith often use, right? And so it's very easy for me as an individual to get on social media and to put out this post proclaiming my position on something. And uh, for and naturally, then people are going to ask, well, OK, that's your position. But what are you doing to solve this problem? And it's it's not fair to say, well, I can tell you what my church is doing to solve this problem. Or I can tell you what, you know, the YMCA that I give to is doing to solve this problem. Um, I mean, if we're going to enter into that space, man, I, I better be invested personally in, in solving that problem. Now, my job as the CEO of a nonprofit in this industry is to then give you, Chris, an opportunity to get personally involved in solving that problem. It's why I wouldn't say our greatest need right now is uh, someone to write us a million dollar check. I mean, I'll, listen, I'll take a million dollar check, uh, <laughs> of course. But um, man, if, if, if I could have... Uh, someone who said, you know, I, I don't need a salary. I just want to come in and, and invest like a staff member um, in these youth and young adults. And I want to learn that's, I mean, that's, a, that's, a, that's as good as, as, as a check to me. Um, we have to reach out and provide those opportunities in this sector. Churches, uh, they're going to have to figure out in the next few years, how they play a role in the conversation. Um, I think it would be very easy for churches to say, hey, listen, th th these are the services, the programs and the offerings that we have, and to completely break away from social agencies that are, that are doing this work as well. Uh, why that wouldn't be good is because you do have some knowledge on those social service agencies that, that churches do not have. I am not a licensed social worker. I have a staff uh, that is comprised of a lot of people with expertise and knowledge, and I rely on them. I wouldn't expect a church to uh, be able to help a youth or young adult navigate the housing uh, systems that are built to be able to access some housing programs in the city. That's, that's too difficult. It's too complicated. They need us for that. But in return, I'm not a church. 
So I, I don't know if I'm in a position right now at outreach where, um, I, you know, we're not going to be baptizing anybody. We're not going to be administering sacraments. We are not a church. But if a youth uh, ever wanted uh, to participate in a church, man, if we, have, if we have some that we can point them to, we gladly point them to uh, a place where they can worship. So I think that's the, the caveat behind it, um, man. But you, you're, you're right. You're you're absolutely right that you know I think there's going to be a prevailing narrative. The um, hands and feet yeah. are out there; it's just sort of hidden. But I think your point of well, I give to my church and they do X, which has personally convicted me a lot lately. Um, you know, is is very well taken. It's like, what are you actually doing uh, to be the hands and feet? And so I think that's that's a great perspective. So I know you give tours. So if people want to get involved, I mean, how? Uh, we'll get into the involvement conversation after that, but I, I want to get back to, you know, the, the organization outreach. We are talking to Andrew Neal, who is the chief executive officer, their website scrolling at the bottom of the screen. If you're watching on YouTube, it's also outreach, Indiana.org. Do, do people show up at your door? Do you go out and identify homeless teens or teens experiencing homelessness is the better way to put it. Like how, how do you get in contact with uh, your, I don't know if you call them clients or patrons or whatever term you might use? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. Um, yeah, we, we have a number that, that, that show up at our door. Um, so we're on the near east side of Indianapolis, uh, right off New York Street. Um, you know, we've got a good presence. We're actually right across the street from Westminster Neighborhood Services. Our program center is open Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, nine to four, um, you know, we we serve meals. I mean, there's just a ton of services that people can get just walking in and we get a lot of walk-ins uh, on that end. We also have um, a really cool partnership with us, uh, an adult and child called YouthLink. Um, I, I, you know, I mentioned this earlier, but the navigating uh, the housing system is really difficult. Um, so is, you know, situations for those who are about to become homeless. Um, YouthLink is a program that allows us to do two things. We help with navigation and we help with diversion. So diversion is a little bit different than, you know, what we think of in the criminal justice sense. It's more uh, diverting youth and young adults from literal homelessness. We don't want them to end up in a shelter. Um, and so because of this innovative program, we have this really great hotline uh, that anyone can call. Um, and, you know, if, if they fit within either our navigation or diversion program, we're able to do some uh, pre-screen with them and get them connected to the right people. If they fit better within the services that outreach itself provides, we get a lot of people referred that way. Um, and there's some that, that don't fit within either of those buckets. And we have great partner agencies that we can refer them out to. So those are the two primary ways. Uh, I also want to point out, you know, the reality is uh, the Near East side is changing rapidly. Um, we know that, you know, the, the neighborhood, uh, the demographics are, are changing. We recognize the fact that uh, the population we're trying to serve is, is slowly being uh, spread out throughout the city. Uh, that's why, you know, we're really focused on uh, this idea of launching some satellite locations strategically uh, throughout the city. So we have one on the old south side uh, that can meet youth and young adults there. We're going to open uh, hopefully in the next uh, six to, to nine months, one in Lawrence. Uh, there's a large population out there. And then we're looking at the west side as well uh, as being another target area. So um, if you can't get down here, um, the goal in the future is going to be, well, we'll come to you. Yeah. So what's changing? I mean, I, I have an idea in that you drive through Brookside and that part of town. I'm, I'm over here in gentrified Fall Creek Place. You drive 10 bucks east. You start to see like the Joanna Gaines houses popping up next, sort of like what happened with Fountain Square. And in this area of town, uh, is that what's happening there? What effect is that having on the neighborhood? And, and you know, why why are things spreading? Give us some insight into what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, for uh, <laughs> uh, w whether you're a fan of gentrification or not, the reality is it's it's happening. That change is happening. I think on the Near East side, a lot of that was initiated by the Super Bowl uh, initiative. I think that kind of kickstarted everything. Um, I think we imagined that it would take a little bit longer for that change uh, to embed itself uh, than what it has. I, I feel like the pandemic has only um, accelerated 
uh, that transition. And so what we're seeing around here is, um, you know, before there were a number of abandoned, uh, burnt out houses, um, you know, now we're seeing a lot of those uh, houses are sold oftentimes to out of state property owners um, or people who are going to flip them and, and, and make a good profit off of it. Property values are rising astronomically. Um, and it's just not uh, not a place anymore where one, our, our youth are going to be able to live. Um, cost of living is just astronomical, um, especially in this area now. Um, and and, you know, as a neighborhood changes, um, I think one of the things that we're going to be very aware of at outreach is, you know, is this a place where our youth are going to be comfortable coming down and getting services? Um, right now it is. I, mean, I think we've got a great relationship with our neighborhood. Um, but if that ever changes, I think we're going to have to adapt and, and figure out what it looks like. Because the reality is, you know, and, and scripture even told us this, the poor, the poor will always be there. Um, and we've got to be prepared uh, to minister to them wherever they go. Yeah, there there was a, I think I've talked about it on the show a little bit. There, you know, there was a center proposed right by and, and the neighborhood mobilized and it's no longer going to be built right here. I personally didn't think it made a lot of sense where there's no bus lines or, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but that probably would have not been true 15 years ago. So, so what you're basically saying is as the neighborhood gentrifies, well, we just don't want homeless people hanging around the corner. It's going to affect our property values. So then you have to find somewhere else to move to. Cause I know you just moved into a space. You have like a, a building now, a physical building, correct? Yep. A $2 million, beautiful building. Um, it's, you know, it's five years old. Um, but I mean, we're, we're even bursting at the seams and yeah, obviously we don't want to, uh, to have to, to move out. And, and I don't think we're, we're anywhere close to that. Um, but that's the reality. I mean, uh, not, not to say that Indianapolis is Denver, but Denver not too long ago went through the same process with their homeless shelters downtown, where as the downtown demographics changed, uh, businesses were very clear. We do not want the homeless hanging around downtown. And Denver tried to figure out what that looked like. They tried to institute a no camping ban. Um, and then they were shocked when homeless people started to matriculate outside of the city center and they're ending up in suburbs. Um, it, you know, I, I think we wrestle with that. Um, just like you were explaining, I, you know, as, as neighborhoods change, I think what we desire in a neighborhood uh, starts to rise to the surface. And, and oftentimes um, some of those values uh, just don't equate with the people who are there. And um, it, it can be very unfortunate. Um, we can, on our end of outreach, we can advocate for our youth and young adults and to have this be a, a place for them. Um, and I think there's a lot of other partners here over here that, that would say that they're open to that as well. Westminster's one of them. Inglewood uh, is another one that's doing some great things. Shepherd's right over here uh, in this area. I mean, all of us are advocating for those individuals. Um, but, you know, we, we also, uh, the one thing I know about power and privileges, I can't control any of it because um, that's, that's just not my reality. Yeah. Interesting perspective. All right. So how can people let me and I keep forgetting to end on the central question here. What do you see in your day that you wish everybody understood? Let us look through your eyes and learn a little something. Yeah. Um, you know, two things. I'll give you two things. And we talked about one already. One, I, I think the number of youth and young adults um, that are experiencing homelessness in a given year is drastically undercounted. I mean, we're talking about thousands and thousands of youth that we aren't counting. And in a, in a city like ours, that should cause all of us to ask ourselves, what can I do to make a difference uh, for these young people? Because no young person should have to not know where their next meal is coming from, not know where they're going to spend the night. That is just unacceptable. So that's one thing. Um, the second thing that I would say is um, each of these youth and young adults are 100% worthy of the investment that we make in their lives. They are some of the smartest, most resilient, uh, most capable young people that, that our city uh, has, has ever seen. 
They need opportunities. They need chances. Um, they, they, they need employment opportunities that, you know, it's, it's, it's got to go beyond a McDonald's, Chris. It's got to go, you know, I can get a kid a job at an Arby's or a McDonald's. Um, they're going to last two weeks. They're going to get in one argument and they're going to walk off the job because they've never had anyone show them. And so we need people to take time to an opportunity to invest in these youth and young adults. I mean, what, what would it look like if, yeah, we had businesses that were willing to open up these positions and allow a place like an outreach to uh, walk alongside as a coach, these young people, as they work for your business, knowing that they're going to mess up, knowing that they're going to fail. And it's not going to be a place where it's a one and done. It's like, okay, this is a process and we're in this for the long haul with you. If we had philanthropic business people uh, like that who wanted to do this, um, if we had churches that were like, yes, we're going to go beyond giving money, we're going to we're going to invest in relationships. Um, and if we had more interconnectedness between our agencies and between the faith community, I really think we can tackle this problem of youth homelessness. I love the idea. Like people think, oh, if I'm going to serve the homeless, you're going to go down and like scoop some food and which I'm sure you do that and clothing ministry and all that stuff. Like the way you can serve is just hiring somebody from your population and being patient. <laughs> That's yeah. a great, a great, great call to action. Uh, shameless self-promotion time. Tell us how we can donate, how we can give. I know there's an Amazon wish list. Tell us the website, anything. This is the floor is yours. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah, if you want to give, uh, great. We, we, we would love that. We'd appreciate it. Outreachindiana.org is the website. Um, you know, I'm, you know, just don't don't give just because you feel bad. Um, give because you're investing in these young people. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say this. If you want to have a conversation about this, um, if you want to know, you know, what this looks like, maybe you're in Carmel or, you know, maybe you're a college student um, who's like, man, what, what what kind of a difference can I make in my community or with my relationships? Um, the philosophy of outreach doesn't just have to be outreaches. Everyone can embody this, which is cool. So reach out. My email address is a Neil, N-E-A-L at outreachindiana.org. I'd love to talk to you uh, about that. If you want to come and uh, learn more about this problem, go online to our website. You can come and take a tour with us. Um, we're also going to have a, a big event September 10th at the Harrison Center. Um, it's going to be an experience like no other, and it's going to give you uh, a taste of what our youth experience and uh, the role that outreach plays. So we'll have more information about that on our website as well. I go to Redeemer. The Harrison Center is really cool. Talked to Joanna last night. So yeah, it's uh, that would be a great experience. Definitely sign up for that. All right, Andrew Neal, Chief Executive Officer of Outreach. In is it Indiana or Indianapolis? Uh, Indiana. Yep. Okay, Outreach Indiana. Excuse me. That, those these are the questions you ask before the interview starts, but that's not how we roll here. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you, Chris. It was a pleasure. And thank you, listener, for checking out outreachindiana.org, and we will see you soon.